We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and oh boy, do we have a lot more news to talk about this week. So much news, I'm so excited. Yay! Yeah. Not yeah. like we don't ever run out of things to talk about or we like can find something to talk about, but we actually I mean, have look at the duration of our last couple episodes. <laughs> like we we have plenty that we can we can figure out how to talk about. Always, 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 always. Oh yeah. so today's episode is our second round of winter break updates. We last episode we didn't have too much to talk about besides Gunther. Um, leaving Haas but like Catherine said we definitely have a bunch to talk about today and then you know we'll continue to do updates in our season preview of course um, but my favorite thing to talk about is back it's not I'm not gonna say silly season graced us early because it didn't but we do have contract news which is my favorite thing to talk about you guys all know that um, yeah. Lando Norris has signed an extension on his contract with McLaren. So his original contract was through 2025. And to avoid, you know, anyone picking him up or poaching him, they have extended him through what is rumored to be 2027. I love this for Lando. Yeah, I think this is this is great. I mean, it, it it's also like not a surprise. Like no. it's it there are I think you know, of the, what, 14 driver contracts that are up this season, um, the, like, there's a subset of those contracts that is just, like, we're just waiting for the contract extensions, contract announcements to be made, and even though Lando isn't on the list for this season because he, it, like, this contract was, you know, not supposed to be up until the following season, it's still not a surprise. Like, of course, he's going to stay with McLaren. Where would he go other than Red Bull? But, you know, Red Bull, there, there's a long line of people for that second Red Bull seat. Yeah, I, there shouldn't be, but there is anyways. Um, but no, I'm very excited. I think this is really smart for McLaren too, because he's, you know, constantly getting better. Their car did pretty well. You know, as a team, they had an incredible, like, second um, part of the season. So I'm yeah. really excited to see what Lando does this year. I really hope he gets his first win, um, but only time will tell. So yeah, I'm I'm I am still I've I've said this before and I'm I'll say that as again I'm I'm still waiting for a Fernando Alonso win and a Lando Norris win. Um and I, I'm really hoping we can see both of those things this coming season. Definitely, definitely. And the other contract um news we have is another extension for Charles Leclerc at Ferrari. So his original contract was supposed to end after this upcoming season 2024. Um he will not be participating in busy season because he's been extended through basically the decade. It's yeah. been rumored that it's either 2028 or 2029, which seems like a lot, but this is no surprise whatsoever coming from Ferrari. He's like their golden child, golden boy. Um, even though Carlos Sainz is the you know driver that won a race last year. Um, but now I feel like Carlos is not coming back to Ferrari because of this. I mean, whether, I just don't think he's going to stick around very long. Um, Cause you know, we've, we've heard in the news lately that there have been some, they, they, they started negotiations with both drivers during the winter break, um, which we didn't really expect because they, you know, Fred Vassour, team principal, even came out and said that they weren't going to be talking contracts with the boys until closer to, you know, midway through the season. And then they said, it's winter. We have nothing else to do. Let's talk contracts. And you've got this monster extension for Leclerc. And then you've got rumors of issues with negotiations with Carlos, which doesn't surprise me um but also you know it, it really makes me wonder you know where would he jump ship to if he's going to jump ship before the regulation change or before Audi comes in? um and you know what are the optics of him sh signing such a shorter extension compared to Leclerc well I'm sure that's why you have the issues with your contract negotiations because I mean 
it's not like they're he's not going to find out about LeClaire's contract, right? So if right. they're offering him through 20, 28, 29, 30, whatever, and Carlos, they're like, oh, here's a year. Like, that, I, I mean, I'm not Carlos, obviously, but I would feel super offended and be like, well, fuck you, because that's annoying. And I should be able, like, they should have comparable contracts. It's not like one driver is significantly better than the other. They always say they don't have a number one driver, number two driver. So why are they not getting the same contracts? Yeah, and but by I mean, not giving them we both also the same knew. contracts. I know we knew, but like by not giving them the same contract, it's like clearly showing favoritism. And this is our number one driver. This is who we're investing in in the future. And you're not it. Yeah. I mean, hopefully what it does mean is that Carlos is setting himself up for a future with another team that, you know, won't treat him like crap. <laughs> God, let's hope. Um, yeah. Hopefully he doesn't have to be strategist and driver in his next team, but I don't know. Yeah, I think it's... I mean, I can see, you know, we've had rumors um, for, you know, for drivers that have been, like, looking to Audi. Carlos has been has been tied to those rumors, and so has, you know, Nico Hulkenberg, and that could be, you know, an interesting teammate, teammate pair up in, what, two, two seasons? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. It's just... I guess the grass is always greener, or potentially. It's not like Ferrari's doing incredible things right now for Carlos to leave. It's not like he's leaving, you know, a Red Bull, let's say. So, right. I don't know. He's leaving as their only race winner in the last year. Yeah, exactly. If he would be leaving. So. Um, and, of course, you know, just just to, to throw that out there, and not that I haven't said this before, but my front runner for the second Ferrari seat, if Carlos does leave, is Alex Albon. 100%. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What he was doing when the, in that Williams last year? Are you kidding me? I mean, yeah. He 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 deserves a step out of the midfield. Obviously, you know, his his time at Red Bull was very challenging for a lot of reasons, but yeah, he's he'll get he'll get to to one of those, uh, you know, other cars at some point. Um, but as of now, these, you know, these silly season contract updates are not a surprise. We will get to the the crazier part of silly season, you know, once we actually get to silly season in, you know, July. When can Audi start uh, contract negotiations? Do you know? That's a great question. I don't. Because, like, let's just say for hypotheticals, they start – conversations now I'm sure they've already started but like when can they actually sign a driver would be interesting to know if that's because that has to affect this year's silly season and like the timing of extensions I mean people can always be bought out i.e Daniel Ricardo but um it's just a a good a good question yeah it it would really I I think it'd be the the season you know ahead of you know when they come on the grids so that would be so we would get those announcements in 2025 yeah. yeah um in other ferrari contract news ollie Behrman, who um he's part of their uh young driver program he drove for haas in uh the haas young driver free practice sessions last season um he has been promoted announced as the new ferrari reserve driver for 2024 and charles leclerc's brother arthur leclerc who just left the ferrari young driver academy has now been added to the roster of um, Ferrari's development drivers, so he will be doing a lot of sim work for Charles and Carlos. While also, I think he's he's racing in, in another European series this season as well. Um, but it comes to what no surprise that Arthur Leclerc is also going to be continuing in the mix with Ferrari. <laughs> Nepo baby. Um, but I also want to know, like, if this was part of Leclerc's contract of, like, hey, by the way, you have to pull Arthur on to, to some part of the team because um, he needs to do something. Um, you know what that reminds me of? What? Um, when I was in – so I went to high school with a former 
child rapper named Lil Romeo. Um, oh my who God, ended stop. up no way. I did, yeah. Um, and he was on the he was on my high school basketball team. He's really good buddies with this like star basketball player out of New York that was like heavily recruited all over the country. Um, and this player can't remember the guy's name, um, but he uh, was getting recruited by USC, and he basically said, you know, hey, um, I'll come to USC if you also give my bro, Percy Miller, a scholarship. Um, so that's how both of them ended up on the USC basketball team. And then when I was in college down in Tucson, every time they would come down there and I would see, you know, Lil Romeo sitting at the far end of the bench of USC's basketball team, I just had to give myself a giggle. But that's what it oh kind of reminds me of. It's like, hey, if I'm going to stick around and do really good things for your team, you got to bring my friend along. And that's in so this funny. case, the friend is brother. Oh, Arthur. He will always just be Charlotte Claire's brother, unfortunately. He is a, he is a solid driver, to be fair. Let's no, throw I know, that but out like, there. He's a good but driver. To me, to me, it's just like, oh, Charlotte Claire's brother. That's yeah. just how I Oh, absolutely. But, yeah, agreed. All right. It's time to talk about the elephant in the room, Catherine. I think you're talking about the uh, the big bull in the room. <laughs> the bull in the china no. shop, if you will. Yes. Oh God. <laughs> the we're back at it with our, you know, 27 name teams. The Alphatari's new name has become official and they uh, they're the Visa Cash App RBF1 team. Yep. I don't need I, I, don't, I don't it's RB, why. not racing bulls, racing bulls or red but it's they're just gonna be referred to as R, the RB team, which I think is like the dumbest part of it. Like so we know that we know that they're the Red Bull B team. And like I don't have as much of a problem with that as other people. Zach Brown has been back in the news um lately. He's the CEO at McLaren. Um he's always been very vocal about the you know issues that they have with team partnerships, specifically Red Bull, Toro Rosso, whatever the hell they're called now, and also Ferrari and Haas. Um but just calling it RB is just so dumb. I don't like it. Yeah. I have like a lot of thoughts on this and it's not, none of them are positive. Um, we hated, I don't know. I just, ugh, I don't, I'm, why? Like, I didn't love That's Alpha the only thing Harry. I can say. No, but like, it was easy and we knew it. Like, Toro Rosso was great. Yeah. Why did we not go back to that? Like. Because they can make more money this way. I, I know why. I just hate it, and it sounds dumb. Yeah, so, I mean, I sh- I I might just take the the Ted Kravitz route and just call them Toro Rosso anyway, like he calls Steak F One Team Sauber. I'm gonna just call them the B Team because let's be real, it is that the is what B they team are, or the JV Team of Red Bull. <laughs> but so, can we also just talk for a second about how this the rebrand all went down? Because just yeah. like with Alfa Romeo rebranding to steak and how weird that played out on social media. The way that, you know, Alpha Tauri disappeared, like they all of a sudden at random just changed their Instagram handle to Visa Cash App RB. And we're all like, excuse me, what is this? And then the entire account just disappeared from Instagram for days. Um, and we're all like, um, Where'd they go? Then they finally returned as Alpha Tauri. Um, Alpha Tauri posted some, you know, thank you, goodbye content. They announced that the Whatever It Takes documentary is finally up on YouTube. We've only been waiting for like six months. Um, we will discuss that in an episode at some point just because it's a racing documentary. Of course, we're going to watch it. Um, but then they they finally came back as the Visa Cash App RBF1 team and have announced the shape and color of the car numbers. And that is what we have so far. Yeah, we've got the font, the colors, a few things. I don't hate the colors. Don't hate the colors. I don't either. I also like the font. I just don't like yeah. the name. I, they've definitely moved to a Visa Blue, which, like, obviously makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. I think it's going to have to take a lot to win me over on this, but hopefully the creative with the livery will be, you know, good. 
Um, to be honest, I didn't love Alphatari's livery, so I'm fine. It was like, very getting plain. It. it was very plain and boring. Um, so, you know, with all of this, with Visa bringing in a bunch of money, Visa's a global brand, um, maybe that'll help with Alphatari's I don't know, presence. We'll see. I have no idea what to think of this. But and also speaking yeah. of Visa, they are now like the first global partner for both Red Bull and Red Bull B team. Um, or the Visa Red Cash B. app R B F one team, if you would like a mouthful. Um Yeah. We're going Red Bull A, Red Bull B, because <laughs> that's what I like better. And we make decisions on this podcast. But Visa exactly. is now a global partner for both. So it's the first partner that they've had for both teams. So I think that's also kind of cool. Interesting. I like yeah, the it's, it's, really, it. It, it's really showing the, the continued global sponsorship investment in um, in Formula One as a whole. You're, you're really seeing like, you know, for, for a while it was just like, select European brands, select brands that have been specific to, to motorsport. And now we're really expanding to like, everyone knows what Visa is. Everyone knows, most people know what Cash App is. I wouldn't say Cash App has the best reputation, but that's an entirely different story. Um, and I know that's not the intent of what it's used for. Also a different story. Um, but I'm really, in, I'm really curious to to see, you know, what is this car going to look like? And and we haven't really talked about this on this podcast yet because we obviously started last season midway through. Um, but what I'm really curious is, you know, livery wise is does this mean that uh, you know Red Bull B is also going to follow in this bandwagon of um, cars that are really limiting the amount of paint that they use as a weight saving um, measure, um, making the cars all just look like black Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> just every car is going to be black with all the the carbon fiber and just like absolutely nothing else. Just on the way, the name. That's it. Yeah, I feel like we're going. I. To. I don't like that. I don't want no. that to happen. Um, a lot of people the are saying are that they so need to fun. separate. Like exactly. Them. They they really need to separate the the weight limits and the, the weight maximums and minimums from the paint. Like let them have their paints. And I know that, you know, every gram is like a tenth of a second or a hundredth of a second, but like you got these cars have got to A be fun to look at and B be recognizable while watching on television or watching at an actual race. Yeah, I think they need better regulation around how much carbon fiber they can have versus paint. Yeah, because if, if you, you don't at, make it a regulation, then everyone's going to take off as much paint as possible. Exactly, so. exactly. And if you look at the new McLaren car, and we're not going to go into our all of our thoughts on on the new McLaren car with they just up and released out of nowhere instead of just announcing the date of their of their livery release, they just released it on the sixteenth. Which cool. Go ahead. Honestly, do this that. this is so Zach Brown though. Like being, I'm going to drop it and not tell anyone and I'm gonna be the first to release it like that's kind of just the attitude I I the energy I feel from him and yeah. it to me it just screams like Zach Brown wanted to be the first person to the dance it's very something an American would do which as <laughs> McLaren is like this historic <laughs> non-American team being run by an American that's like like that's what I really think of not the um, Americans ruining F1 again no, let's not go into that. There, we we will discuss Haas at nauseum at and you know the Andretti situation that we have yet to hear any updates about. Um, but we will do a full episode on our thoughts on liveries and the cars once all of the cars have dropped. Um, we've got a few more dates that have been announced, which is very helpful. So now we know when every car is going to be released starting this coming February second with Haas. I'm very excited. This season, we're getting yeah. new faces, and we're also getting news on possible new races. Yes. So, Madrid is going to join the grid as a street race in 2026. Yeah. Silence speaks volumes, <laughs> I will say. I mean... I just, I love Barcelona. I know it's like... It doesn't mean that Barcelona is not going to be on the grid, 
or on yeah, the yeah, schedule. Yeah, but like, yeah, no, if we're not gonna have two races in Spain, I highly doubt that. Um, and no, I said I said this to you when uh Dominicali um implied in a statement that Barcelona still has a chance I I said I texted I dm'd you and I said the United States will get a fourth race before Spain gets two races in one season um and, and I still speaking stand of by a that. fourth race <laughs> we potentially have a Chicago GP um F1 has registered trademarks for like 27 different names for a race in Chicago which that would be our fourth Formula One race in the United States. Or if Vegas is just dog shit and they can it, then it would only be three. But yeah. I like this. I want it to be a street race. I know we all, like, not everyone loves street races, but I think a street race in Chicago would be oh, super yeah. cool. Super cool. Because yeah. didn't NASCAR do, like, a street race in Chicago this year? Or, like, some... I feel like they did. They, there was there was some kind of motor race in in Chicago. I mo- most of my thoughts related to Chicago are on the TV show Chicago Fire and the one Chicago shows. Um, if I'm not watching sports, I'm watching procedurals. Um, but I I would love this. That would be cool. Um, but to go back really quick to talk about street races, like this, you know, the announcement of Madrid has, you know, really upset a lot of people who are like, I'm really tired of street races. Um, I personally am in, am going to give Madrid a benefit of the doubt because A, they're not coming on until 2026 and we have a ton of other things to think about until then. But B, we like, we made so many jokes about the Vegas track and how stupid the Vegas track looks. Um, and, and, you know, we, you know, all of the memes, the fact that it looks like Roscoe Lewis Hamilton's dog, but upside down. And it turned out to be one of the most exciting tracks and most exciting races of the season. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. I don't know. I honestly add add five more street races if it gets rid of more uh, sprint weekends. Like I, I don't care. I'm I'm just over I'm over the sprint format. But also, I don't know. I don't hate street races, but I think sometimes they tend to be not as exciting. However, you're right. Vegas was a very exciting race. So yeah, and I will and- hold my judgment until we have our first. Our first race yeah, in I mean, 26. You know, obviously, I, I am also, you know, not always a fan of street races. You know, Jetta is not my favorite street race. I know that a lot of people have opinions about Monaco. Um, Baku as a street race, I think, is actually fine. Um, yeah. I know that some drivers, Max Verstappen specifically, are pretty vocal about not liking street races. And I understand the issues with street races, you know, come with things like um, the, tr- the physical track issues that we see uh, or that we saw in Vegas and things like that. I just, Formula One has a number of issues. That's not the one at the top of my list of concerns. <laughs> I've got a whole top 10, top 15 of issues, and this is not one of them. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just, it, it's, maybe it's because we haven't been involved in the sport long enough. You know, I I think that it's important to to mix up you know, the, the types of circuits that we race on, because that's, you know, another layer of giving these drivers challenges. If you're not going to do something like reintroduce tire wars, which I don't want tire wars to come back. And no. we talked about that in the, uh, 2005 Grand Prix, um, F101 episode of, about, you know, how that happened and everything that went down when we had tire wars. I'm not interested in tire wars, but it is another layer of, you know, strategy. Yeah. No, I think, you know, if Chicago comes on, who knows if it'll be a street race or not. There's not a ton of land in Chicago, so I feel like it has to yeah, be a street race. Yeah, it has race. to be. Unless it's going to um, be in, like, what, Evanston? Or, or, like, way, way out. Yeah, I don't know. But I love this idea of having a Chicago GP, just, you know, obviously depending on the time of year it will be, because um, it does get very cold there. Chicago but also in the Madrid spring joins, would be really cool. Yeah, I agree. Um, Maybe, like, alternate Chicago-Miami. Well, and that's the other thing I was going to say is, like, I feel like four races in the U.S. is excessive and people are going to get annoyed and pissed off about it, like, fans. Um, 
so I feel like there'd have to be alternating races. Yeah, Whenever I would love would. to see you know all all you know alternate even if it's three and one of them changes every year. Like you know, I I see the benefit of having you know more races on this half of the planet because the interest in formula one is growing in you know north america south america you know i'll take a second canadian race you know on the the other side of canada things like that i and i think it's it's you know one of the things that that formula one as a business understands is that the interest is growing outside of europe which is why we have so many races in the middle east now so yes you know unfortunately sorry european you know formula one fans you can't go to two races in spain um but you can go you have a number of options of races that you can go to in the united states and yeah chicago will be a pricier race but it won't be as pricey as miami or vegas no in my opinion. And Coda I mean, the first one affordable. will be. But... Yeah, Coda is the most, the most affordable. Hit up your local Costco price. and you can get a discount. We love Costco. We do. I still, I think it would be cool if they did one on every continent, like besides Antarctica, obviously. So like getting. That would be really cold. <laughs> wouldn't be possible. Um, So like getting one on the African continent, I think would be pretty cool too. Because it truly is like a global sport. Yeah. And I mean, so at, you know. Continents. Lewis Hamilton has talked repeatedly yeah. about the return of South Africa. And I think that South Africa would be culturally really cool to see. Um, but also I've heard really good things about that track. I know that, that some of the issues involved with that track are um, it's not currently the rated for Formula One with the way it's right. constructed. Like the the purpose-built circuits um, have to meet a certain number of criteria to qualify for, you know, Formula Four, Three, Two, um, you know, Super Cup, um, all the other different types of, of motorsport races. Um, and right now, South Africa just like doesn't currently qualify. Yeah, but that's not saying and it's like also in the expensive. future it could. So. Right, and I, I that's, that's one that they should bring back. We talked, you know, in last week's episode um, about the 2016 recap about bringing Malaysia back. Um, and, you know, there people want to bring India back too. Yeah, India India is a big one. I, I think that it would benefit Formula One. And I know that, that there are a number of tracks that would not like, there are a number of countries that would not like this at all. But I think that what something that could benefit Formula One is to have, you know, rotating locations. Like it's not always, you know, we're, we're not going to Austria every year. Sometimes instead of Austria, we're going to, you know, we're, we're going back to, to, you know, France and Paul Ricard. Um, you know, we're not going to Miami every year. So, you know, sometimes we're going to Chicago. Maybe they bring one to Phoenix. There's lots of motorsport fans here in Arizona. That would be really fun. Things like that. No, I, I really like that idea. Just, I know it's not going to be popular with a lot of people or with the drivers, but you throw more variables and variety out there, it's more challenging on the drivers, which makes it more exciting to race. Like, I mean, we have coming back this year, all drivers for the like what first time in F1 history, everyone kept their seat. And so it's the same drivers, the same track. Yes, they're changing the cars, but at the same time, it's the same track. So if we do pick like five races right that stay every single year but then all the other ones rotate I think that's you know cool and different I mean I know that the the ability to see different races and it's not just like the same ones over and over and over yeah and I know that there's like the the question of like what are the historic tracks that you should like should like this this came up with when spa's contract came up is like how can you possibly get rid of spa well spa's weather sucks um and you know the track is not always the greatest so there there's but it's you know, spa, there's, Catherine. It's I know, spa. but it's spa. I mean, my first experience <laughs> with spa was when George got his very first podium after three laps. Like, like, I uh, come on. But like, um, you know, spa, Silverstone is a big one. Monaco, like, yeah. I feel like those ones you can't get rid of. Right, they're just the like, classics. Yeah, and like even even for the fact that like oh Monaco is just a parade, but it's Monaco. Like I don't care that it's a parade. Like it's also you know qualifying. Like 
duh, it's great. Um, so I, but I, I don't, I don't think that the drivers would be as opposed to a rotation of, um, the, the calendar and, you know, so, you know, some years you're going to Malaysia, some years you're going to India, South Africa, just to get a little bit more variety on the calendar. I think that the tracks themselves, those contracts would, like they would never go for that. And then all of no. the Middle Eastern stakeholders that are flooding money into Formula One would lose their goddamn minds if we don't go to <laughs> Qatar, Bahrain, Jeddah, Dubai, um, Abu Dhabi, you know, like yeah. they would they would lose their minds. Oh yeah, no, it, is it realistic? Probably not, but again. Is it for the betterment of the sport? Podcast. Yes. <laughs> no, because the more that you travel to and change up your, your schedule the more fans you pull from different countries and different things like that so yeah but, and it would be more fun I, on a I travel logistics standpoint which you would love I do I love the idea like I just love the whole business beside behind f1 it's very fascinating very yeah. fascinating so um something else in the news which I honestly this has so out of sight out of mind dropped off the face of the earth for me me too the sag aftra strike and the writer's strike all filming for movies and tv shows everything that's scripted or is this affiliated with sag aftra um was halted and so if you remember going back brad pitt was filming a formula one movie <laughs> um and that obviously had to stop. It was supposed to be filmed at like specific races during the F1 season to help get real actual content um, that they, you know, wasn't fake. It was actually there at the race. We saw them filming with several of the drivers at some races. Um, But Catherine, you did some sleuthing. Where are we at on this movie? Is it still being made? Yeah, so I kind of just, I was like, I, I when I was writing up the rundown yesterday, I was like, oh, we haven't heard about the Brad Pitt movie in a while. And I the, one of the biggest pieces of news was that there was going to be an 11th garage on the grid for the second half of the season. And we got, what, maybe two races, three races before um, every, you know, filming had to shut down, which for very good reasons. Um, but... Um, we haven't heard much. And then I did some, I did some little Googling and Brad Pitt and Javier Bardem, who's apparently also in the movie. I did not know about that part. Um, were spotted in Florida to film scenes for the movie at the Rolex 24 in Daytona, um, which is, you know, a, that's one of the, the biggest, um, races in in daytona um and one of the biggest fanciest obviously if it's sponsored by rolex it's a big deal um there have been a couple little um issues indycar driver scott mclaughlin um was denied entry into his motor home because he didn't have proper credentials on him which is hilarious because it's literally a man straight out of the car and then bubba wallace who i guess he is usually in the coveted infield lot was booted into the outer outflow lot Um, because all of the, you know, filming, um, you know, trucks and uh, RVs and all all stuff for for filming the movie um, were taking up that space. Jensen Button, who um, was also there, was saying that it was impacting his sleep because they were doing a lot of filming in the middle of the night. Um, And so was Colton Herta. Um, Apparently, they they both heard all of it from their their RVs. Um, But they are filming. They have the spec car that they got from Mercedes that is going to be the Formula One car that Brad Pitt's um, going to be racing with. There were a couple of other cars that have been made for the movie um, that have also been on the track that they have been using. So filming is is back on schedule. We don't know anything about a release date or even a name. It's been called the Apex F1 movie. Um, but And we haven't gotten any updates or changes on that, but it probably will change at some point. Um, but yeah, it's, it's back. It's in the news. I wouldn't be surprised if we um, start seeing um, Brad Pitt and the film crew show up to um, races for the season to, to, you know, finish everything up and, and get the actual Formula One race environment on film. Honestly, I'm just going to say it. I don't think we're going to get this movie till like 2026. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be a while. Like, I don't see this coming out anytime soon, but Obviously, I'm excited regardless of when it comes out because it's an F1 movie, which is 
I hope they yeah. do it justice and I hope they do it well and it's not like some cheesy terrible movie um I, I think I it'll mean, be a good movie. I think it'll be pretty good though yeah with all of the like f1 teams that are involved in it and also like Brad Pitt usually does a good job when he's producing a movie apple tv or apple plus has produced and you know released a lot of good movies so i'm very hopeful that this will be good whenever we do get more yeah i think i i have you know i'm optimistic for it obviously there will be a ton of creative license and we'll probably be able to turn it into a drinking game of some sort um not that we can do an excessive drinking but um, and we can do it with Lewis Hamilton's non-alcoholic tequila. Um, I still want to, I still have to try that. I'm going to do it. I don't think it's been released in the States yet. Um, oh. or this side of the, I don't think it's been released yet. Um, but when it does, we will definitely have to do some taste testing. Maybe, you know, dig up a bottle of Danny Ricardo's wine. Wine. And, I know. I was going to say, yeah. we need to do like a, a taste test of all of the drivers and their alcohols. I think that'd be really a fun one to do which I think is funny how drivers yeah. have alcohols because like drinking and driving like don't go hand in hand but yeah well like Valtteri Botas yeah. has he's got gin. his gin line and then he's also starting a winery line that checks out it's probably yeah. Australian wine too that, that guy loves Australia he does love him some Australia oh well um anyway. but yeah anywho we also, like Catherine said earlier, we do have the final car release schedule for liveries. Um, Haas comes out on February 2nd. Steak and Williams comes out on February 5th. Alpine is on the 7th. Visa Cash App Racing Bulls. No. Visa Cash Red App Bull. RB. 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 Red, Red Bull. I liked Racing Red Bull Bulls. too. Like it was growing on me. Red Bull JV comes out on February 8th, Aston Martin, February 12th, Ferrari, February 13th, Mercedes, and the real drop of McLaren come out on February 14th, and then Red Bull A-Team, or Varsity, is February 15th. So we got a lot of liveries coming out in February, and also like Hasan mentioned, we are going to do a whole livery roundup episode after all these are announced, give our thoughts, feels, questions queries opinions opinions that no one wants to hear i'm already just shaking my head at alpine i don't know what's coming out of that garage oh my well here here's the thing i just uh it's but here here's the problem is like if you want to go all in on a pink camo car then just do it like the pink car that we got from alpine last year in my opinion was better than the blue car um but they only had it for two races the Pepto Bismol car is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I'm the pink sorry. car. The blue car. I'd rather was so have the pink better. car. I I, I have to. Do, I I didn't like. You have to do something that's you know going to allow you to stand out. You know from from the crowd a little bit, like you know Williams and the Duracell battery and the um the outflow bit. Like I want to see some creativity out of these gosh darn cars because we know that well, we're not going to get it from Mercedes or Red Bull or Ferrari. We can get creativity, but it like they just threw up Pepto Bismol on the car and said we're gonna stand out. Like do something with the design, do something with sponsorship. Like the Google tires for McLaren. Love genius. the Google Love. tires. Love that. But that's not like a color, that's a creative product or creative sponsor placement. Same with the Williams and the Duracell battery. Like super yeah. creative. That stands out. But just making your car Pepto Bismol pink is not like being creative. You have to. You it, have to. Agree it with was me on different that. compared to the rest out? of the group. Yes. Yes. That's okay. That's okay, that's where disagree. I'm coming from. Okay. That's where I'm coming from. I I do feel like there's gonna, there's not going to be any pink or any camo on this Alpine car, and they're just like trying to throw people off. Well, because they're like, what's underneath? So maybe it's like exactly. They're gonna, you know, remove it. But if it is pink camo, I'm. Oh, I just 
that would that would be it's hilarious. Terrible. But because it like you know, Red Bull last year was kind of they were made fun of because they had so much hype around their reveal, and it's the same damn it's same car. car. Um, yeah. So so I'm 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 fully expecting that, and it's like, but that's fine. It's Red Bull. We you know we like their consistency. Ferrari is going to be the same thing. Mercedes is going to be actually. I'm actually curious about Mercedes um, because I'm I'm I want to see what you know, if they release the redesigned car, because the car will be a car that looks more like an Aston Martin and a Red Bull, because they finally realized that their dumb side pod experiment of two years did not work. They've scrapped the side pods. Finally. Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting. Well, anyways, look forward to that. Clearly, we have thoughts and opinions on this. so we will And we sharing. will have more. Because we haven't even seen the cars yet and we're sharing our yeah. opinions. <laughs> Just wait till we see them. Uh, but anyways, so watch out for that episode later in February before the season starts. And we are starting a new, I don't want to say segment, but a new fun thing that we do at the top or end of every episode, which is Catherine's random F1 fun fact. So Catherine is full of fun facts, and she does a ton of research on a bunch of different things. I do as well, but Catherine always seems to find some of these really cool, interesting, fun facts. So every episode, at the end of every episode, Catherine's going to share with us a random F1 fun fact. So Catherine, what is your first random F1 fun fact? So this is actually a really interesting one. Um, There is no second place finisher at the 1983 Brazilian Grand Prix. Huh. Yeah. Did, uh, no, none. I have questions. I have questions. So, so what happened was Kike Rosberg um, was disqualified from second, but none of the other runners were moved up. So the the officially, the position is empty. There is no second place finisher at this Grand Prix. But, hmm. Okay. They but didn't why? say why. What? They That's didn't say why that they wouldn't move people up. That, exactly because, like Coda, this last year we moved people up. Yeah, the, but this this race they did not do that. Um, the race was uh, won by Nelson Piquet Senior, um, and unfortunately for P three, who was uh, the famous Nicky Lauda, he was not advanced from uh, P three to P two. Also, Nelson Piquet Senior is the father of Kelly Piquet, Max Verstappen's partner. So, full circle connected to the modern times. Oh, uh, yeah, circle. that's your fun fact. Huh? That is a fun fact. That's interesting. Yeah. I wonder why they did that. I do too. I, t- I tried to find out why, but it didn't say anything. It didn't say why. Well, thank you yep. for that fun fact, Catherine. You're welcome. We also saved the best news for last. I think we've been waiting for this confirmation. Everybody has been waiting for it. I'm excited for it to drop in, you know, less than a month. Drive to Survive's coming back. Yeah. Finally. So we have Drive to Survive has been confirmed by Netflix that it's dropping on February 23rd, which is a week before the season starts, which is typical schedule. It was rumored that it was coming out this day, but not confirmed by, by Netflix until, you know, um, much, much later than this week. Yes, thank you. Times, they're hard for me. Um, but this was what we were ex- when we were expecting it to come out. Um, so everyone has a week to watch it before <laughs> 2024 season starts, which yeah, I like to pride myself on my binge watching abilities and my binge watching skills. I will be watching all of this on Friday. <laughs> As will I. We we will we will watch it quickly. We will then react to it afterward. Um, but until then, we are actually going to take a step back in next week's episode um, and relive our top moments of the 2023 season that we expect to see on Drive to Survive. And as you will remember, there were a lot of wild moments this season. Uh, so I'm very curious to see how that is going to be portrayed on Drive to Survive. Yeah, I think I also want to talk about things I hope to see. They probably won't be on there, but a girl can dream. Yeah. <laughs> but the, yeah, the so thing about our drive to survive and, and what sorry. we want to see. 
<laughs> the, the thing about Drive to Survive is that like it's a great introduction to the sport, but if you're like li- like it it nothing compares to living and breathing and following the the international circus week in and week out. Um, but that said, you know, even for you know fans who have been fans for a while, I I there's definitely still value in watching it, even if it's just to be like, wow, they really they really portrayed that situation really bad. <laughs> Yeah, you get a little bit of like inside, not insider information, but you get to see more of the behind the scenes on why things happen, what was actually going on, conversations that were had, which is what I like. It kind of like mm-hmm. fills in the whole circle. For me, it gives you a little bit more context. And I think that they've, you know, thanks to the driver's reaction over the last couple of years and a couple driver boycotts for some seasons, like Netflix has hopefully really calm down on trying to sensationalize things because it's already sensational we don't need more manufactured drama yeah I'm I'm interested to see which drivers are really highlighted this that's always the thing that I'm the most like I get excited to see is like what drivers and what um teams are really highlighted because they do cover kind of everybody but they definitely highlight a handful so it'll be interesting and kind of cool to see who's on that like highlight level this but anyways that has been our round two of a winter break news updates that's been the podcast thanks for going off track for us with us ah, thanks for going off track with us guys <laughs>